Good morning. And actually, our, for our speaker in Germany, good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Waldvogel. I am the membership coordinator with the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. Thanks for joining uh, the Colorado Grain Change Home School. Uh, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to just click on that Q&A button. You can type in your questions. Uh, that's the preferred way to ask a question. That way we kind of keep, keep track of them and ideally get to everyone. Um, you can also communicate with each other through the chat function as well. Um, that all being said, uh, at the end, usually a, a common question, a lot of these folks want to be able to share these videos or be able to uh, watch them again. Um, there is a link on the Colorado Grain Chain website, so coloradograinchain.com, and you can uh, access uh, the YouTube links to be able to watch these videos again. Uh, for Colorado Grain Chain members, you can also access uh, the Google folder that has not only the videos, but has recipes, handouts, information, a bunch of good stuff. Um, so that's just a way that you can access that. Um, but I suppose at this point, we'll just uh, transition to our speaker today. Let me introduce Paul LeBeau. He is the general manager of Wolfgang Mach out of Oatsburg, Germany. Uh, Paul is an uprooted Texan who has been living in Europe for the past 38 years. He holds an MBA and is a veteran of medical tech startups. Uh, he considers himself a mock mill missionary and a just-in-time milling mentor. Um, Paul, I'll hand it over to you. You can uh, take it from here and then maybe even uh, let folks know just what they're uh, viewing at the moment. Okie doke. Well, Dan, thanks very much. I'm uh, just delighted to invite everybody into uh, my kitchen here in, in Otsberg, which is a, um, a really small uh, rural uh, community, but only about uh, 35 minutes away from the Frankfurt Airport uh, in the middle of Germany. Um, uh, there are about 3,000 people. I live here on a 19th century farm complex that was purchased by Wolfgang Mock and his wife Elfrieda back in 1982. We're about nine families, about 30 people who live on a, a kind of a courtyard, uh, courtyard community here. Um, so um, what you're looking at is the former um, slaughter room in the, in the, uh, in the, for the farm, which has become our, our kitchen. Um, I'm really delighted, uh, Dan and Andy, that you've invited me to, to, to come along. It's, uh, uh, something that um, people who know me know I'm passionate about. I think that um, Wolfgang Mach's work of the last 40 years um, is, is all of a sudden, really quite suddenly, being recognized as we go through this terrible um, period of, of, uh, of having our, our lives turned upside down. And um, I think it's being recognized for a really big reason. And what I'd like to speak to you about for just about 10 minutes this morning before we have fun milling uh, are the reasons um, that, I, that I believe that. Wolfgang has been out to get people to make their own flour since he built his first mill back around 1980 or first started selling at mills back around 1980. Um, so that's an, authentic, that's an authentic story. It's an authentic mission because if you think about it, you probably don't know a lot of people who have a stone mill at home and that means that he's just doggedly kept at it even though um, it's, it's been a long, 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 uh, long mission. And I'm proud to have picked up that mission four or five years ago and said, well, I'd like to apply some of the, uh, the methods in getting people to change their habits that I had to use to get new diagnostic testing uh, methods started up. We hear a lot about diagnostic testing today in the news. We didn't hear about it for the 35 years that I was uh, was involved in it very much, except when we launched the first AIDS test, and I was part of doing that. So um, uh, that's my approach here is to uh, is to speak to you as I've spoken to doctors uh, and, and other healthcare workers throughout my career about why it's time for a change. So um, uh, Andy, I don't know if you can give people a feed, let them look at my uh, at me for a second. Um, what I'm showing you here is the fact that the stone mill yep. has been with us since the very beginning of our humanity. This is a uh, this is a wax figure 
uh, display in a paleolithic, paleological museum in, uh, in uh, southeastern France. And there you can see daily life in the Stone Age and what's happening right in the middle of the picture, uh, in the middle of the display, this lady is kneeling down and she's milling grains for food. Uh, so this has been with us all our, all our existence. It's really part of our humanity. The stone mill was the very, very first kitchen appliance. Uh, it's a statement I like to use and I think it's defensible. Um, okay, so let's uh, switch over to um, why, very specifically, um, we believe that people should like to, mo to mill their own uh, flour. Andy, can you give me the next slide? So there was a question, why make your own flour? And then on to the next one. So there's five reasons here. Um, one more. Okay, there you go. So there's five quick reasons. I'm gonna expand on those just a little bit for you, try to go fast. But, but uh, look, milling your own flour is really honestly good for you. In fact, there, there's no other food that's as wildly good for you as sourdough bread made directly from cereal grains in their natural whole state. Think about it. Why were prisoners often given only bread and water to eat? Because for a good long while, you can live from only whole grain bread and water. It's got almost everything you need. Ground up and fermented, the modest little kernel delivers food so complex, so complete that it can keep you going almost indefinitely. Okay, you need some vitamins like vitamin C from a different source. But when Chef Dan Barber said, we really need to give bread its place back in the center of the plate, he's reminding us that only a short while ago, bread was the principal food for much of humanity. That's what you ate. But that bread didn't remotely resemble what most people grab today off the plastic bag wall at the grocery store. Uh, it was more like what you can get now at select bakeries, like Moxie in, uh, in uh, Louisville, uh, real bread, okay? And even what you bake yourself, though, if you use flour from a bag and if you buy packaged yeast, it doesn't come close to something that can sustain you. We're talking about the whole complex cocktail of endosperm for energy and its precise complement of the germ and the tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of discrete phytochemicals, that make up the brand, which is the packaging of the kernel. So this is really honest to goodness, good food that you're not getting if you're buying it uh, from uh, in, in, in some kind of industrialized form. Um, the second point is you're in charge. What does that mean? It may be the most important thing I'm giving you to think about tonight, uh, today, because I'm talking about some pretty cool rewards you'll get if you start milling grains you buy to make your own flours for baking and cooking. But you know what milling got you at home in Europe during the Middle Ages or in Eastern Europe during the Nazi occupation, World War II? The punishment was really severe because milling is power. With it, you control the availability of food, you control what goes into the flour people eat, and you control what happens, you, go into, uh, you, you control what happens to the various components of the good grains. You can use that power to determine what gets grown, how it gets grown, and who gets what part of the reward for delivering it to the consumer. So if somebody far away is doing your milling, they're making a lot of decisions that could be yours, the decisions to make. And you're letting them do it at the cost of privileges that could be yours, starting with the privilege of eating only the freshest food. The third reason is the flavor. And wow, most food people experts agree that flavor comes first. So this is important. Speaking of privileges, I feel these days like one of the world's most privileged people. Privileged because it's my job to seek out high profile chefs and bakers and find out what they think about just in time milling. And often enough, although they're, from, they're out there forming the opinions of all of us as to what we should make important in our culinary lives, uh, they haven't thought about what having a stone mill at hand could do for them. They're not all, they're not all like a moxie bread. And you know what they say when they get the chance to try it out? They say, oh, it's the flavor. 
I first met bread tasting giant pioneer uh, chef Michael Calanti at the in the summer of 2016, more than a year before he took time to try out one of our stone mills for his baking. And then he told me, I'll never bake again with anything I don't know myself. The difference in flavor is just that big. So you want to understand that better? Anyone, who, anyone who's listening and has, doesn't recognize the difference between fresh squeezed orange juice and frozen concentrated, um, we all know that. So just, just think a little bit about that, the difference the freshness can make in the flavor of your food. The fourth reason is our living culture. And I think especially for those of us who are uh, interested in the Colorado grain chain, this is really important. Uh, because here we're, 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 we're together, uh, brought by an organization that's dedicated to great food and where flavor comes first, but it also strives to be part of the community to build strong relationships. And this is happening all around the world, people blazing trails to bring biodiversity-based agriculture back to their regions, which over the past 120 years bowed to the hegemony of the world's commodity markets and quit growing wheat. Now these pioneers uh, uh, are helping put the culture back into agriculture. And so we can, uh, and so can we. We can do it by helping local small scale farmers find markets for their produce. And by putting that produce onto our tables, we can all support the selfless hard work of those who dare to grow something other than what the commodity markets are buying. And the fifth reason you ought to mill your own grain in our view is it's, a, it's an adventure and it's a lifelong adventure. And here's the kicker, it's fun. At our milling workshops, we have the privilege of making lush flour from lots of different foods. The way most of us are choosing baking flour for our baking today is like the way our grandparents or our great grandparents chose wine back in the day. You know, you, you want red, white, or rosé, or maybe some bubbly, that was it. But we know today if we stop at the store to pick up a bottle of wine, we'd better bring along a quarter hour at least because we'll need that time to make our selection. And grains need be no different. Beyond wheat, there's rye, there's barley, there are oats to mill into our mix. I make bread using various millets. Golden millet, some people only recognize as birdseed. Brown millet with its hearty, healthy hull. Sorghum, sublime and delicious. And teff, if you toast it in a pan before you mill it, you'll get an aroma that knocks your socks off. And heck, why not toast some of all the grains you use when you bake? Put Dr. Maillard's principle to work to give your bread, biscuits, pancakes, cornbread, polenta, grits, porridge, and bread pudding some exquisite complexity. No one can deliver you the things you can discover and invent and prepare in your own home. That is, if you've got a stone mill in, in your kitchen. So those are the five reasons. I, uh, uh, I'd love to get any questions or, or feedback on those at this time, if anybody's uh, got any thoughts they'd like to share. I don't have any questions in as of this moment, Paul, but a lot of times once we, once we prompt folks, they start to roll in. So I'm happy to share as they come. Okay, come in. good. All right. Well, that's, you know, all of the, the, the sort of the, the talk presentation, the rest of it is, is fun and milling. Um, I want to move along here and Andy, I think we can um, bring the camera back on and leave the, let go of the slides. Okay. So people can see the, see the, see the mock mill. Actually the mock mills. So here we are. Uh, and I've got uh, uh, my uh, two mock mills here to show you. One is the one I use in my kitchen. It's one of the very first mock mill one methods that we made. Uh, I've been using it for about three years, uh, unless I've been traveling two or three times a, a week. So what I want to do is um, t take the uh, top off of this, of this baby. Mock mill is striking among products on the market because it's got a, a, a housing that's made of bioplastic. Okay. We, um, Wolfgang had been making mills for all those decades I talked about, and people always felt, ooh, they're a bit expensive. Uh, and he wanted to make a mill everybody could afford, just like Henry Ford wanted to make a car that everybody could afford. And he knew that he could do it by molding, but he didn't want to have petroplastic. And so for all those years, he just avoided the idea of a molded body mill. Uh, put on top of the fact that you've got to spend about a million dollars in tooling to make something like this, just to start with. Um, but he found this bioplastic, 100% or 98% uh, uh, plant fibers and polymers in here. And so this is, is, is really, really cool stuff. And we are award winners for being the first ones to make a kitchen appliance out of that. So it's kind of a, 
a little plug for this material that's called Arbo Blend by a company here in Germany called Technara. Anyway, that's the Mach Mill 100. And when you take the hopper off like that, what you've got here is the top, and I hope people can see this well, you've got the top of what we call a milling chamber. And the, the, the top is just a lid. It's like a lid on a big pickle jar. So you just kind of unscrew that um, and take it, take it off. And that's, uh, that's the lid of the milling chamber. And what you have are two stones. One, the one that is here inside the mill, you see it there inside the milling chamber there. It's attached to a heavy industrial motor. When you pick the, the mock mill up, the first thing you realize, wow, it's heavy. And that's a lot of copper that's in there. That's an honest to goodness, uh, heavy duty motor. Um, and when you flip the switch on, that's, that uh, stone is turning at about, uh, about 1300 RPM over there in the US. So you have a stone that's turning and you have a stone that's sitting on top of it. And uh, let's, see, I, let's see if I can show you a little bit. You may be able to see that between those stones, there's a gap. Well, if I, um, if I, uh, take the, the mill, I don't have to actually do this because you're not going to see any feel it. If I press down on this top stone a little bit and I turn the mill on and then I put some food in here, what I feel is the food pushing up on my hand. That's the forces at work. That's what's happening. And so um, that's what that upper stone wants to do. It wants to move away from the lower stone as soon as we put food in there. Well, we can use that uh, principle to adjust the fineness of what get, gets milled. Because the, big, the more room that upper stone has to move away from the lower stone, the coarser the pieces that come through can be. And the less room it has, the finer they have to be. So to get really, really fine flour, what we want to do is give, that, give this stone very, very little room to move away from the top stone. And the way we do that is with this cap, because Think about it, the inside of that cap is like a ceiling that we're lowering on that upper stone. And the farther we screw it down, the lower the ceiling and the less room um, that, uh, that stone has to move and therefore the finer the flower. So as we tighten this cap down, the flower is gonna be finer and finer. And if we wanna have just coarse broken grain, we open it up in the other direction, we give that upper stone room to move away and the pieces get big. So we want to make polenta, we want bigger pieces. If we want to make bread, we want finer flour. And so that's the very, very, very simple um, adjustment principles of, uh, of the mock mill. So that's all there is to it. And if, uh, when I put this back together and show you how we use what I call the, the clever lever, oops, the clever lever to adjust that, you'll see that all I'm doing is turning this cap because I can't reach inside the mock mill and turn it. In fact, over here in the wooden mock mill, I don't have that need that lever because I can just turn the, uh, the hopper this way. And that's one of the nice parts of the design of that, of that particular model. But there we go. So um, I hope everybody's understood the very, very simple principle and simple adjustment principle because adjusting the mock mill and learning how to get the full range out of it and feeling comfortable adjusting it on the fly is uh, uh, important for getting your full enjoyment out of your uh, out of this uh, this simple but but uh, but really versatile product okie doke so that's how a mill works i'm going to oh, i'll ask it I'll ask a couple questions of you right okay. now, just about the kind of the mill itself. And then we'll, there's um, another one later that we'll get into when we're talking about more about baking, but okay. um, just kind of asking, Dino was asking, you know, is it time consuming? What's the commitment? What's the learning curve of, of the mock mill? And also just uh, if you could speak to ease of cleaning, do you need to clean it between milling different grains? Well, we say, uh, yeah, okay, I, I, you know, I'll give you the what we say. What we love to do is hear what other people say. But what, what users tell us is, wow, that was easy. You unpack, the, you unpack the box, and in a couple of minutes, you're making your first flower with it. Um, it, it. It really is child's play, so to speak. We love to see in Instagram posts of kids milling. Uh, so it's quite fun. And the other point is that it makes, you know, hardly any mess. So I... I uh, mill my coffee as well as my grains with a little coffee mill I have behind me. That thing makes a lot more mess every morning than the mock mill makes when I mill 
uh, a couple of, uh, you know, five or six pounds of flour. This is a very, very clean operation. Um, the time is very little as well. It depends, of course, on how much flour, you, how much uh, bread you're going to make. I made, uh, over there behind me, I took some bread out of the oven just a little while ago. That's um, four kilos of bread or almost 10 pounds of bread. Uh, to make that, I used about, um, about five pounds of flour. Um, and that took, with the 100 that I got here, that took me, uh, oh, about 40 minutes of milling. Um, but I didn't stand and look at it. I just had it running and, and the flour flowing into a bucket. So uh, I did a lot of other things in that time. Uh, so the time commitment, if you're just, uh, you know, you need uh, five or six cups of uh, flour or, uh, uh, you know, a couple of pounds of flour is, is, is not very much. It's um, uh, four minutes a, a pound to be, to be exact. Um, maintenance is very simple. The, the, the amazing thing about the mill, and we can try some of this if you like uh, here online, is that it's self-cleaning. It cleans as it mills. The way to clean the, the mock mill is to mill some dry grains and that cleans it up. If I make a real mess and put some th something in it that I shouldn't put in it, I can scrape as much of the mess out as I can get and then I set the mock mill on course and I put some grain through it. I milled, um, I milled uh, um, tiger nuts yesterday for, for somebody who wanted to know if it, if it works and I wasn't certain what to tell her so I said I'll, I'll do it for you. And in fact, they're pretty oily, and so I had a lot of oil residues in the mill when I finished. Um, and I just got some um, a popcorn, which we say you shouldn't mill, but actually it works really great to clean the mill when you mill it on course. And I, uh, I just ran the popcorn over and over through the mill four or five times, and it was uh, clean as a whistle afterwards. And by the way, I then milled that popcorn fine, and I had some kind of um, tiger nut tasting corn flour that'll go into my next pancakes. So um, uh, the, the keeping the mill clean is very, very easy um, if, you, if you simply um, uh, you know, respect its, uh, its, its principles of operation and, and uh, grind, uh, grind the dry grains that it's in, intended to, dry, uh, to, to, uh, to, to grind is the last thing you do with it on a given day. Um, and maybe run some through on course um, to, to clean out uh, any, any debris that's inside. Great. And uh, yeah, and there was another question kind of around uh, capacity. Um, the question was, you know, do you have capacity to mill for neighbors? But I think also I, I'm a little curious to hear if, if uh, what the capacity is as far as, you know, do you do bulk amounts um, and kind of store your flour? Do you do it separately for each baking event? And then is there, are there any uh, like temperature concerns uh, for okay. the, Flour okay, so that's it. a lot of questions at once. Uh, <laughs> there's, uh, it's uh, put this way: the we have two um, motor-driven performance uh, uh, metrics, and that is the throughput per minute, and it's measured in grams of fine uh, flour from soft, the soft red wheat that's grown here in Germany, uh, and that's a hundred and two hundred. So there's a Mach mill one hundred, the Mach mill two hundred, Mach mill. Uh, Lino 100, Mach Mill Lino 200, Mach Mill Professional 100, Mach Mill Professional 200. The ones will do 100 grams a minute, so that's about three ounces a minute or about four and a half minutes for a pound of flour. That's the 100. And the 200 is twice that fast, so it only takes you two, two and a half minutes for a pound of flour. Okay. Um, we have lots and lots of professional bakers who use the Mach Mill 200s and they use them really successfully, not of course to make all their flour that they're buying in pallets from you know from their miller but rather to make different flours special flours to use local grains to uh make you know use different ingredients to try new stuff out uh and, and what have you so um they find that that um and in fact we have a new model that's been out for about a year now there's the mock mill professional 200 which professional means it runs non-stop that means you can just run it for a couple of hours at a time and it produces about 25 pounds of flour an hour. So a bakery, if it needs 75 pounds of flour, it can get 75 pounds of flour from a $700 mill uh, that it buys, unpacks and puts on its table with no special room and no special training. So um, in that sense, there's a lot of capacity that's there. 
the Mach Mill 100 that I use here is for home use, okay? And I, I'll just give you an example. Um, last weekend, I was asked to bake bread for a farm shop because their baker was uh, taking a day off and he wouldn't be able to deliver them on that Saturday morning. They only open on Saturday morning. And they wanted 36 little loaves of, you know, 350 gram loaves of bread. Uh, my family needed bread and, um, and in fact, uh, it needed bread earlier than I was ready to make a whole bunch. So I made, like I did today, uh, four kilos of bread. That's almost 10 pounds of bread for our family and for my wife's sister who lives next door and her kids. Uh, and then the next day, I made two 15-pound loads of dough uh, that got baked uh, then on, on, on the Friday. And so within about five hours, I milled... Um, uh, I milled about 15 pounds of flour just as I was going along. It wasn't a major activity for me. I was just doing that as part of my baking cycle. Um, so, and that's with a, a you know, a, a mill for under $300. And I've been doing that, you know, every week for not, not that much baking, but, uh, you know, that kind of thing every week for, for three years with these tools. So they're very, very robust in that sense as well. Um, this is a tool that you're going to have with you, you know, for the rest of your life because it's, it's really exquisitely simple. There's just not a lot to go wrong with it. And uh, I mean, it's one of the things about our, we laugh about our business. It's a lousy business because people buy one thing from us once and that's it because they'll never need another one. <laughs> um, let's see. Then we were asked, you asked about temperature. So um, why with a Mach Mill 100, Mach Mill 200, Mach Mill Lino 100, Mach Mill Lino 200, is there a limit uh, to how much the mill can do at one time? Well, because electrical motors get hot and uh, they eventually get uh, to the point that if they, if they keep going, they're going to uh, suffer some damage because they're, the copper in them will get too hot. And so they have a switch built in that shuts them off well before they get to uh, a temperature range that would be dangerous for them. And that means that they can mill about 10 pounds of flour at a time before they need a rest. And the rest is about 90 minutes. Uh, uh, the 100 needs 45 minutes or 55 minutes to get to that point, And the 200 gets to that point in 25 minutes. But it's about the same amount of flour. And then they go, need a break. Um, now, the principle behind mock milling is to, mill, to measure out what you need and mill that just before you hydrate it. And that's to us a really important point. The idea of milling up a whole bunch of flour, spend a whole afternoon milling tons of flour and then put it in the freezer, it doesn't make sense um, because it's so, so easy to measure your grains, pour them in the hopper, turn on the, uh, turn on the mock mill, pour it in the hopper, and then wait a couple of minutes uh, while you're doing something else until that fresh flour is delivered. And then you have its full freshness. You have to remember that flour whole grain flour, this is it's different from white flour, from refined flour, but whole grain flour has a maximum goodness the moment, the moment it hits the mill. And from the moment it's opened, the moment it's broken open, it's losing goodness. And so the greatest thing in the world is to do what I do sometimes do, which is to just let the, the flour flow right into a bowl of water and the, the flour becomes dough before it's had a chance to be flour for more than a few seconds. That's great. Thank you for the thorough answer. That's wonderful. Okie doke. All right. Well, you know, there's a, um, I, uh, I put together a, uh, a small collection of, of uh, flowers of foods that I mill up um, occasionally. And I thought it would be fun to just, I'm not going to mill for very long because it is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a little noisy and it's not much fun to, uh, to uh, to watch the same thing over and over again, but start over here with just typical, you know, red wheat. A lot of people have never seen a, a wheat berry, you know, a, a, a wheat kernel, and I think that's amazing because we eat so very much of it. Um, and when people look at it, it, it's hard for them to realize this is a life, and there's a life, and that's a life capsule is what it is. There's a little embryo in here uh, that's going to stay vi uh, viable for years, maybe even decades. Okay, and the reason it's gonna stay viable is because it's so exquisitely packed with these great phytochemicals I was talking about 
earlier, this incredible, uh, this incredible eight layer tapestry of tens of thousands of different chemicals, the names of which we'll never know and the, or we won't give them all names and, the, uh, and, and just exactly what they do, we won't know about. But anyway, there they are. And in, in, uh, in bigger milling operations, for a lot of different reasons, these grains get broken down into their components, into the white meaty part, the food, the plant food that's there for the embryo. The, you know, the, uh, a little kid once at, the, uh, at uh, Whole Food Nations at uh, our stand in, uh, in Denver, when I asked him, what's a seed? He said, a seed is a baby with its own bottle. <laughs> I thought that was great because that's what the white part of the flowers that we eat, that's the plant food for the baby, uh, for the baby plant. Uh, and so those things get separated out. And what most people think of when they think of flower, they think of white flower, and that's just the plant food. But there's also the germ that gets taken out and used in, an, in animal feed usually. And there's all that bran that's what our gut bacteria need to stay healthy and happy. So in, that's what you have here. And when you turn the mock mill on, you listen for it to, uh, you, you uh, adjust it downwards for, uh, hang on a second, I've got to screw this in all the way. Um, you adjust it downwards until you hear a slight stone ticking. You hear that? And then in goes a little bit of fire. So the delivery of the flower is instantaneous. It starts coming out the moment it goes in. And so that will tell you it doesn't stay in there for very long. Now, it, that brings us to one question that was asked that I found a sidestepped about heat. People will worry about the flower getting warm. And uh, boy, I, I was concerned about that when I first got started five years ago as a, as a neophyte in all this. And I sought out advice from the best cereal scientist I could find, uh, Dr. Andrew Ross at Oregon State University. And he said, well, I don't want to do this on the phone. Come visit me. So I got on a plane and I went to the West Coast and I included his Corvallis, Oregon there and went to see him. And, and I got to his lab at nine o'clock in the morning. He'd been baking. He'd baked 24 loaves of bread to answer my technical questions. And his point on flower temperature, he said, why are you concerned about flower temperature? And I said, well, because it disturbs people that the flower is warm when it comes out of the mill. And he said, well, why does that disturb them? And I said, well, they don't like it. He said, well, why, what do they think is wrong with that? And I said, I don't know, maybe they think enzymes are getting damaged. He says, Paul, there's enzyme damage starts at 70 degrees Celsius. Your flower is never gonna get that hot. And uh, he said, uh, and besides, whole grain flour, freshly milled, has got so much enzyme activity, bakers have never seen enzyme activity like that in the flours that they use. So what are they worried about? I said, well, maybe they're kind of worried about protein damage. He said, Paul, protein damage starts at 80 degrees Celsius. You're not going to get there. I said, well, maybe they're worried about vitamin degradation. He goes, Paul, you're going to bake it. <laughs> <laughs> so the lesson I got from my trip uh, to Oregon was we shouldn't be concerned that the flower is uh, getting warm as it comes out of the mill. It's not in the mill for very long. You saw how quickly those, those uh, um, uh, grains went through the mill. When it comes out, it cools down quickly. And anyway, we're going to put it in water right away. Uh, and so it's kept, we're capturing all of its flavors, which is one of the reasons you may be concerned if you kept flour warm over a long period of time, it would lose its, its, uh, its flavor, but we're not doing that. So uh, that's to me a really important point if people are concerned about the fact that milling uh, flour, uh, milling grains creates warmth, the warmth goes into the flour, the flour will be kind of warm to the touch when it comes out. But what's gonna, what you're really gonna notice is how good the bread tastes. So anyway, that was just wheat. Um, and what uh, I want to talk about mostly now for the rest of the time is all the different stuff that you can mill because we think of flour and we think of wheat. But, you know, wheat is just one thing. And there are all of this huge, huge, huge plethora of foods that we can mill, that we can use in different ways and that we can start to enjoy, um, you know, from our own hands uh, that, are, that are, are not wheat. 
Uh, and that, that starts, so over here I have a lot of things. A lot of people have never seen rye. Rye is a really interesting, it's a pretty, pretty gray green kind of grain. It's really earthy. If you think of, uh, most Americans have never had real rye bread. You buy rye bread and it's got, I don't know, 10, 15% rye in it. But if you, you can make rye bread out of 100% rye, and if you want to be kind to yourself as a baker, you may use only about 60% and 40% of uh, uh, some kind of wheat. But it has this wonderfully deep, earthy flavor to it that uh, is kind of like what you experience when you, when you drink a really heavy red wine, when you get these really great, complex, floral and, and different flavors versus um, drinking a nice, light white wine, which would be your lighter breads on the other end. So rye is a, a, is a real big staple. It's a staple of parts of the world where um, uh, the summers are short, the growing seasons are short, there's a lot of rain. Um, it's a much more robust crop than wheat, and, and, and so it's used in, uh, in the northern parts of Europe in particular, and is gaining popularity in the U.S. thanks to guys like uh, Stanley Ginsberg, the, the rye baker down in San Diego. So there's rye. There's all the different kinds of variants of wheat here. I use a lot, we use a lot of spelt here in Germany. That's, a, that's my bowl of spelt, but we also use einkorn and emmer, and emmer, einkorn, and spelt are the three oldest kinds of wheat that we knew about. They're genetically distinct uh, and different from then what we call wheat, which is our, which is what I was showing you before. So they're really, they've got their own characteristics and they, um, not only does the whole class of spelt have its own flavors, but the spelt is gonna have its own terroir. So Colorado spelt, uh, of which there's starting to be a good bit, it tastes a lot different from spelt that might get grown uh, somewhere else in the country or different from, from what, I, uh, what I bake here in Germany. Um, and that, you know, the other cereal grains, the big one is barley, which gets forgotten a lot, but it's a really great grain. It tastes a little uh, grassier than the stuff. It's a, it's a great crop. Uh, thank goodness we have beer brewing because that's what most of the barley that's grown is used for, for beer brewing and also for animal fodder. But it's great human food too. And it, it, to, to use in your bread enriches the, uh, the, the nutritional um, profile of the, of the bread that you make. And so I, I use a lot of uh, barley. I love to toast it a little bit before I mill it up. It has just a great aroma. It makes the whole kitchen smell wonderful. Um, I, put, uh, I put rice in my bread from time to time and I like to play with different kinds of rices. This is just a brown basmati rice, but it's wonderful. But over here on my table, I've got five or six different kinds of rices step away for a moment, including, you know, including some really dark and flavorful ones like black rice that give your bread a really special color, kind of a purple color. Wild rice, which isn't really rice at all, but uh, it comes almost exclusively from North America, is incredibly tasty. Um, really uh, provides some interesting flavor for your bread if you use a little bit of it. So, uh, so I, I go for the, the this, this tremendous amount of variety in my in my baking. Um, so over here I have many many more things to talk about and show you if you'd like to. Uh, there's a huge corn revival going on especially in the Rocky Mountains and in, in Colorado too where people are learning to grow the corn that the Indians, uh, you know, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, Native Americans have been growing for centuries and centuries and that the people in Mexico have been growing for forever and discovering all the beautiful colors. Take a look at this. I mean, we all know yellow corn, right? This uh, uh, really great for milling. Um, uh, Nana Meyer's husband, Dan, gave me some of this, uh, some of his heritage corn here. And then look at some of this. This is like deep purple corn. You can imagine the color that your food gets when you use that and the strength of the, of the rice. So, um, those are the cereal grains, but it's just the beginning of the flavor adventure when you've got your own mill uh, of what you can start to experience. And the neat thing is you can keep all these grains. They won't go bad on you. So you can afford to have a huge granary, you know, 15, 20 different kinds of grains and mason jars, if you like, that will keep forever. Uh, and you use them as you need them. It's very, very hard to imagine keeping that many flowers because they won't stay fresh. They won't stay good. And a lot of things you'll never get flowers of, you know, like get some mung bean flour. So mung beans are really cool, you know, <laughs> and you can make your own mung bean flour. Maybe you can find some somewhere, 
But if you got mung beans and you use them uh, in different ways and for sprouting, they, they've got an incredible nutrition profile and taste. And you can mill some up and put it in your bread. I'm monologuing again. So have we got any questions? Sure. Well, you just answered this one essentially, but um, Brett was asking, you know, about storing wheat berries, how long you should consider storing them in the best environment for storage. Well, the best environment is, you know, like everything that's food, you want to keep it out of light. Um, you want to keep it dry. Uh, you don't want it to get um, uh, really hot. Um, it, you know, if you want to keep it forever, you can put it in, toss it in the freezer. That works really well. Uh, but you don't have to. Uh, so just as long as they're kept cool and uh, fairly cool and dry and, and, um, and, best in a closed in a closed um, vessel so a mason jar i mentioned anything that's you know a plastic uh, bucket with a lid on it uh, because you do want to keep um uh keep uh pests and bugs away from it it will attract you know it's food so it'll attract uh, those guys and uh, but if you seal it up it's fine now i don't reckon that, recommend that people buy years and years supply um anything can happen but um gee if you if you have six months supply of, uh, of uh, wheat berries uh, and you've got them in a, a nicely sealed bucket, they're not going to go bad. They'll be fine. Great. And you, you spoke some to, uh, you know, uh, the temperature of flour um, during milling. And you also spoke to the Maillard principle when toasting grains. There was a follow-up question too, just if you have any other mm -hmm. thoughts and would like to elaborate on the benefits of toasting your grains before milling. Well, the toasting of grains, the benefit is flavor. It's just, you know, and I'm not so sure which benefit is bigger, the, the flavor that in the bread that you can maybe detect. Remember, when you put all these different flavors in the breads, it isn't as though, you know, um, wow, this is a, I can really taste the whatever it is you put in there. Um, because, in fact, you get a new flavor experience that doesn't have anything to do with what you associate with that food. When I put beans into my bread, I, I bake a lot of, use a lot of bean flour. I don't taste the beans. It doesn't taste beany to me. And it's logical that it not tastes beany. Why? Because what I'm tasting is not so much what was in the grain, but what the bacteria and the yeast in my sourdough have done to it. I'm, I'm tasting the metabolical product of the consumption of the molecules of the, of the starches and everything else that are in there and, and how that interacts with all the other chemicals in there. So I get a, a you know, a completely new flavor experience. Um, and when you use, uh, when you toast things, uh, then you get again, a different flavor experience. Uh, and, but above all, the aromas in your kitchen are, are incredibly, it's so, just just so wonderfully, uh, you know, wonderful just to, the, to have that, that toasted caramel aroma in your kitchen is just uh, a treat all by itself. Um, I love to toast things like teff, if you, little tiny teff. It's a tiny, tiny little grain the Ethiopians use for their classic bread. And when you mill it up and taste it, it just kind of tastes a little grassy and nothing special and not so sure that you want to get excited about it. But when you toast it in a pan, let it cool down a little bit and then mill it. It just has this exquisite kind of cocoa and, uh, you know, kind of chocolatey, uh, um, nuggety kind of flavor. It's just, it just, it's really, really surprising. But you can toast everything. You can toast rice and then mill it. You can toast, I'd love to toast kamut and then mill it for flavor. The thing is, when you do that, when it comes to wheat and you're making bread, you're destroying the proteins in the, pretty much in the bread. And so you rely on those proteins to give your bread its structure. So you don't want to toast too much of it. Um, I generally assume, and, and I'm not a professional baker, so I go a little bit out on a, on a limb here, but, uh, and we got some good bakers listening in, but they know that I say this and they never counter me. I count on 75% of my flour weight being enough fresh wheat, whole wheat, to give my bread all the structure it needs. And so the other 75% can be whatever. It can be toasted wheat, or it could be any one of those kinds of ingredients I've talked about, because only fresh wheat with its full protein uh, structure will provide structure for the bread. 
Nothing else does. That's why we eat so much wheat is because only wheat, wheat is the only thing that has functional gluten and the functional gluten is what gives our, our bread structure with the exception of, um, of rye, which has a uh, different structure offering uh, chemistry. And then all the different binders that get used for making uh, gluten-free bread. But the natural binder for bread, and that's why it's been with us for tens of thousands of years, is, is the gluten that's in wheat. So you need, you need wheat in your bread. But you don't need it to be all wheat. That's the point. Hey, Paul, I would, I would pipe in one comment that is, um, you know, more and more people are, are breaking those rules with making pan breads, like a German-style rye bread, and, and swapping out uh, non-wheat stuff like lentils and corn and different gluten-free ingredients. And, um, you know, you get a dense loaf uh, similar to a German rye, but it's so delicious and appealing. So I think, you know, I wouldn't really, I, I would agree that more than um, anything less than 75% of wheat flour in like an artisan type bread makes it pretty hard to get the kind of loaf you have in your, you know, your, your mind's eye. Uh, mm -hmm. But once you move over to a pan, you know, the kind of world's your oyster. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a funky baker because I've never baked except with flour I milled myself and I use all kinds of stuff, but I'm addicted to pans. I, I watch the, the, the beautiful freestanding loaves get made by the people and I say, well, let them be experts at that because that's not what I'm after. Um, and of course, my job is to stand here and convince people it's really worthwhile to, uh, to take this adventure of, uh, of milling and... Um, and, and that's why I'm so focused on what you can put in it. But you're right. The pan forgives everything. Um, the bread I made today, um, you give me the chance to show off my bread, Andy. Um, the, 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 this bread is still warm. I just took it out of the oven. But this is 75% uh, uh, whole wheat spelt, whole spelt, and 20% um, tiger nut flour. So I milked the tiger nuts I talked about earlier. And, and uh, gosh, it smells so wonderful. I can't wait. Um, maybe it'll be cool down enough before I go to bed to cut into it. But um, the pan makes it possible because this dough was so soft. If we had tried to do a freestanding loaf with it, it would have just made a pancake. <laughs> so, so, you know, Paul, you, you've got so many great ideas for um, just kind of opening up options for what you can put into bread. I mean, I feel like your approach to baking is beautiful and, um, when we were talking last week, you were mentioning something about field flowers. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Oh, sure, sure. So um, you can, uh, the, well, first of all, the mill, the stone mill is, is great for anything that's, that's not principally moist and not principally oily. Uh, and I'm sorry, I was gonna actually get some flowers and, 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 and do that and I forgot to collect them this afternoon. But um, flowers are moist, we know that. So, well, I guess that's no good, right? Or um, sesame seeds are oily, so I guess we can't mill those, can we? Well, I always say, what are you gonna do with it? And if you're gonna include it in, in a dough, then you can always mill it together with dry stuff in the mock mill, okay? So, um, what I, uh, I, I'm um, uh, working together with a woman named Vanessa Kimball who runs something called the Sourdough School in England. And she is um, she's studying very hard the effect of what we eat on our microbiome and focused on bread and, uh, and, and the fact that sourdough bread is probably better for our digestion and for our bugs than other stuff. And, and, and by the way, uh, eating bread with a lot of variety of, of, uh, of uh, ingredients is also better for our bugs. So she's studying this. And she suggested putting blossoms into the bread and just go out and into a place that you know hasn't been sprayed with anything and just pick field flowers. So I, 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 uh, I've been baking her bread and, and uh, I had a lot of fun with that uh, and I've been, been working on it. And what I found is that uh, if you can distribute the flower petals well enough uh, and in small enough pieces, um, you can just mill them along with your uh, wheat without really giving it much thought. Um, and so what I've been doing is putting, uh, uh, using a blade mixer, putting uh, the flowers that I'm going to use in with some wheat berries 
and letting the blade mixer whack around at that whole mixture. And it gives me a nice kind of crumbly um, mass of, of, of flowers and, uh, and wheat berries. And I just throw that into my mock mill with some more dry wheat berries and out comes a kind of a green colored flower that smells amazingly good. And that, um, that is uh, this fun to use in the bread. I, I can't say that the bread is terribly floral. It jumps out at you says, this is lots of, uh, there's lots of um, buttercups in here. Um, but I, but I do know that there, that I have a nutritionally more um, varied and complete loaf of bread. So it's a lot of fun. Um, along those same lines though, Andy, you can do, if you dry your foods out, the flowers included, then you can mill them all by themselves. Look here, this, can anybody guess what that is? This is stinging nettles. So I was up at the orchard day before yesterday and I bought a whole big bag full of stinging nettles back with me. I had to cut those carefully to keep my hands from getting attacked. Uh, and then I just uh, stuck them in my dry, dry, uh, dry, uh, dehydrator. So these are, these are very, very little light um, um, leaves of, of stinging nettles. If I take those and in my hand, let's just do this. Um, I take those and crush them up. By the way, they're highly nutritious. If I take these in my hand, I can just crush them up into, into you know, kind of a powder here, just in my hand. And then feed them into the mock mill. I don't know if you can see it coming out now. No, there's any visual effect there. And I'll turn this off for a second now. But you can see this is done. I've mm. got powdered stinging nettles. So I can do this with spinach. I can do it with kale. I can do it with whatever food I want. Now this will give my bread some pretty sexy color, you know, <laughs> or my noodles if I want to do pasta, you know, and I want to do spinach pasta. There's a guy on the internet, uh, Mr. Aaron's Goods, who's doing this a lot with his mock mill with fresh spinach that he then dries. Um, and you can do this with any number of uh, any number of foods with all your roots, with your beets, with your um, sweet potatoes. Make great flour this way. Guy, uh, Guy Frankel out in uh, in L.A. pioneered this. A lot of this stuff, including the flours and the fresh herbs mixed together with grains. That was all stuff he started doing four or five years ago uh, in Instagram. Oh, and it's just makes it possible to just kind of knock yourself out and get really creative. That's great, Paul. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we, we've had a number of other questions come in that we can't possibly get answered in the next five minutes. So just wanted to, uh, well, I guess put you on the spot. Uh, you know, if we, we send those over to you, if you might be able to uh, just, just be able to provide a couple answers and we could uh, get those put Absolutely. on the Google folder for uh, brain changing. Absolutely. Okay. Very, very happy. I'm, I'm just delighted for the questions. Uh, helps us to understand what, what questions come to mind and what should we be addressing in, in, in the talks that we do. So we have just a few more minutes, but in this interim, before I hand things back over to you to close things out, I'd love to, uh, Ask the folks on the call too, you know, as far as uh, upcoming topics for these homeschool sessions, you know, what would you find of value and, uh, you know, what would you tune in for? If you don't mind, maybe just typing some of those into the chat function. Um, just love to really keep putting the word out there and finding things that are going to speak to people. Um, so that's a request for folks that are on the call, but wanted to pass things back to you, Paul, for the last couple minutes and, um, and uh, yeah, anything else you want to share with us today? Yeah, well, I, uh, I don't know. I've, uh, uh, I've really kind of done a lot of talking and um, I was really great, uh, grateful that Andy came in and added uh, that this, this idea of putting different stuff in your, in your bread is now no longer being kind of considered off the wall. Um, it, the possibilities are endless. I, again, I have a whole table over here full of stuff. Uh, and I rub my hands together every time I'm going to bake bread and say, what am I going to do different this time? Uh, and uh, that's the invitation really is to get a tool like this and, and, and take control of your food. Start paying care, more careful attention to all the, the yada, yada, yada about what you should eat more of and actually do it and start to realize how enjoyable it can be. 
because everywhere you're reading, if you don't want to get COVID, you should be eating more whole grains, right? Um, it, it's, uh, that was in Psychology Today, by the way, uh, just, just uh, this week, uh, an article along the lines. We're not getting enough fiber. And the reason we're not getting enough fiber is because the fiber is taken out of our foods for a lot of different reasons. And it's especially taken out of the wheat that we eat. Um, the way to, if you think about it, your body needs and deserves all the fiber of the food that you eat. And the work that, that's being done now in the Colorado grain chain is very, very much focused on bringing the foods closer to the consumer and, uh, and taking, my sense anyway, it's taking a lot of the refining out of them. And of course, by having a stone mill, you allow yourself to do the minimal refinement that's necessary to make those really great foods. So I, I can just uh, almost promise you, this is, you know, this, uh, uh, this little investment that you're asked to make when you, if you want to get into this, is one you'll, you'll certainly not regret. And I'm terribly grateful to people, bakers like Andy, who uh, in these last five years, um, when five years ago, just a tiny little handful of them were at all interested in, in doing their own milling, have come and said, this makes a huge difference to the quality of our bread. This makes a huge difference to the quality <clears throat> of our uh, pizza, uh, of our noodles, of all the stuff we can do. And it makes it a lot easier for us to support our local farmers and, our, and, and support the the principle of, of bringing food production closer to the population. Um, so I, I just would ask you to consider really hard joining the food revolution. I will say um, that if you go try to buy a mock mill right now, you can't because there aren't any not anywhere for sale in the United States because uh, with the, with the, uh, the virus uh, and the kind of change of mode of, that a lot of people have been forced into, um, we sold like about four months worth in about a week at the beginning of this thing. And, and, uh, we, we're rushing like crazy. We're delighted to, to need to be making so many, but we, we, we couldn't have planned for it. Um, and we're not the only ones. So if people will just be patient by July, we're pretty sure we'll be back to equilibrium and you, you know, there'll be plenty of mock mills for the taking. And in between there will be mock mills available too at mockmill.com, uh, mockmill.us. Uh, so, um, uh, please, if you're, if you're interested, you know, let yourself slide down the funnel and, and, and do it. Um, I, I think that, um, I feel very confident saying that it's, it's a move that you'll be certain not to regret. Well, we are hey, greatly, hey, Paul, Andy. Uh, we're greatly appreciative there, uh, Paul, we, uh, of everything that you've shared today with us. And uh, really love, you know, just your your message here at the end too of, you know, taking control of your food, but also, you know, supporting not only the farmers that produce it, but, um, you know, supporting that full chain of of millers and bakers and distillers and brewers and everybody else in that chain. And uh, Absolutely. Know, yeah. yeah. And this isn't about bypassing, by the way, if I can just say, it is not bypassing the miller. Without those millers, you're not going to have millable grains, you know, so they're really important guys. Um, but they are also starting to realize, wow, let's let the consumer take it to this last step. There's 95% of the work that goes into making flour um, is done long before you crush the grain. <laughs> Andy can tell you all about that. <laughs> hey, hey, Paul, I just want to say thank you so much. I feel like, you know, every time I hear you speak, I'm, I'm super inspired. And I feel like your depth of knowledge and your creativity and passion on this topic and many others is uh, refreshing. Um, if people want to hear more from you, um, get in touch with you or, or learn more about mock mills, what are the best avenues to do that? So the easiest uh, is to, um, first of all, follow, uh, go on, if you're on, we're most active on Instagram, a little bit less on Facebook. Uh, Instagram is mock mill is Wolfgang's mock mill. Unfortunately, mock mill was taken. So Wolfgang's mock mill, all one long word. And, um, I am Paul underscore Lebeau underscore Germany. Um, I know that's a little bit difficult, but if you, if you look for hashtag mock mill, you'll easily find posts from either me or, or Wolfgang's mock mill and just follow us to start with. Uh, from that point, interaction is very easy. We're very, very interactive. So if you message us, 
we're going to respond. If you post anything because you've got a mock bill and you've posted something you're proud of it, you're going to get a big cheer from us. Uh, we try to respond to every single post that's made about our products. Um, and uh, and there you'll be in touch. Uh, if you have specific questions, you can always write to me at paul at mockmill.com. Uh, there's also info at mockmill.com for you know general questions. Uh, our partners in the U.S. Um, uh, the Mockmill USA is is run by Bretopia, out of Iowa. They are incredibly good people and incredibly hardworking. Uh, right now, they're just swamped with all the demand for not only mills that they can't respond to, but also for the great flowers and, and grains that they make. They're a great source of grains. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different ways to join the mock mill community. And we're always happy to hear from people and uh, trade ideas and uh, uh, put, other, put people in touch with one another. Very often I end up saying, you need to know this person or that person, um, uh, if that's your interest. Because this, this whole grain community this whole grain revolution community or uh, is, 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 is full of wonderful, wonderful people that are worth knowing. Great. Well, thank you so much, Paul. And yeah, and speaking of that grain community, folks can, uh, can uh, find their place in the grain chain by jumping on coloradograinchain.com as well. Um, but thank you so much for the hour and uh, learned a bunch. And um, as always, I'm always glad that this happens right before my lunch hour because I am I am ready to do something good. So thank you. Well, enjoy it. We'll have some uh, have some stinging nettle salad. I'm sure. It'll be oh, there you go. Yeah, that, okay. those, those are hard to find in Colorado. We'll uh, we'll uh, we'll see you next time at on uh, Colorado Grand Chains Homeschool. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Andy, and thanks to everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye, bye.